Hi guys, welcome to your video lecture that's all about the zones of the ocean. So we spent yesterday and Monday discussing just a general overview of what the ocean is like, what's in the ocean, how it moves, uh, some of the ocean features of the crust, as well as some human impacts and human uses for the ocean. Today though, we're going to dig deep into the different zones of the ocean. So you're going to need your electronic editing notes on ocean zones. They look like... This right here. Fantastic. Once you got those pulled up, you are ready to rock and roll with this lecture. So we're going to be learning about the oceans today, the different ocean zones. We're going to go over some things that we've already talked about. Here's our standards that we're talking about. Not that you particularly care too much about that. Something we've discussed already in our previous notes, but let's write them down just so that we remember. Oceans are the largest bodies of water on Earth. One of um, your peers asked if the oceans were separated by anything, and that's a really good question because we say we have five different oceans, but they're all actually connected. In general, we separate them based on how their surface currents flow. So the surface currents give us a general idea of what ocean you're in, if you were, say, on the border of the Southern and the Pacific Oceans, though, you wouldn't see any um, sign or anything that said, now leaving the Pacific Ocean, entering the Southern Ocean. They just generally look like the same body of water. It's uh, more so goes by how the currents move. Again, just a reminder that oceans account for 97% of all the water on Earth. The other 3%, again, is fresh water, most of that being locked in ice, icebergs and snow. So 97% of the water, that's a lot of our water. That's the majority of it by far. Remember, we have five oceans. Type these in the in your notes as well. We have the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and the Southern Ocean. Fantastic. So we've got five different ones. All of this has been reviewed up until this point. Let's get to our new information. Here's our five oceans. Again, there's no divider or anything right here. This is free-flowing water. Generally, we separate the oceans based on their currents, the surface currents that are moving in them. So we know we have a circular gyre right here in the Pacific Ocean. And then we've got a um, more straight, straighter current right here that spans across the Southern Ocean. Generally, we divide our oceans based on those currents. Ocean zones. We've got three of them. The very first one is called the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone, sometimes referred as the seashore, is the area that is above water at low tide and underwater at high tide. So this would be where you are standing on the beach. We can generally stand in the intertidal zone. It's not too deep. Uh, if you're in, say, a marshland or an estuary, it might be above your head um, as well. Again, our estuaries and marshes are part of this intertidal zone. This area can look like a lot of things. It can look like your typical beach that you might think of here in North Carolina. It could look like, again, an estuary. It could look like a river rising in, in, um, in level because the river is tied to the tide or it, the river experiences tidal effects. Um, it could also look like... Thinking. We could also um, occur not only on our giant continents, but it could happen on some of our islands as well. These areas, because they're so diverse and they have many different habitats, we find a lot of different animals in them. We can find some crabs in them, some sea fish, some or starfish, sea urchins, and numerous species of coral. Generally, we do have access to this area as humans, whether that be with some scuba gear or just um, us walking and viewing or swimming out. This isn't too far from the land at all. Organisms living in this intertidal zone have adapted to, envir to environments of harsh extremes. So again, because um, these are generally organisms that can be in the water and out of the water because they're living in the area that is above water at low tide and underwater at high tide, 
Not only that, but these organisms can live in temperature ranges that can be anything from very hot, so like our tropical waters, and with full sun, again, our tropical waters, think coral reefs, or near freezing in our colder climates, such as Antarctica and the Arctic, or even areas like Greenland and Iceland. Here we've got an example of our intertidal zone. So all of this, except right here, is our intertidal zone. It's separated here into upper, middle, and lower. Not something that you necessarily would know, but just remember that the deeper you go, the different kind of species you might see. Some of our organisms might be less exposed to the atmosphere and more able to survive underwater, whereas things like these will be really exposed to the atmosphere and not exposed too much to water, just a little bit. And then we've got all kinds of different things in between. You can see examples of sea anemone, sea stars, and this looks like coral. Don't forget though, not all things are animals. We've got plants as well as our microscopic organisms like bacteria or our, uh, macro invertebrates like shrimp and larva of other species. Fantastic. As far as the intertidal zone goes, just so you know, low tide is where the intertidal zone becomes dry due to low levels of water. High tide is where the intertidal zone becomes submerged with water. So this zone right here is the intertidal zone. It's between the tides. Inter means between, tidal means tide, in between the tides. So when you reach low tide, the water is as low as it's going to go down here, and then eventually it'll make its way up to high tide, and then it'll start going back down again, and it's cyclic, and generally, especially here in eastern North Carolina, this happens twice a day. We get two high tides, two, high, two low tides. Remember back from our video lecture yesterday that tides happen because of the gravitational pull of the moon on the earth and we have two we have the actual gravitational pull of the earth er, of the earth's water from the moon where the moon is right across from it but we also have the inertia effect where we have that equal and opposite pull in the direct parallel direction all review from yesterday so that's the intertidal zone and again, the tidal range we'll learn about in Earth Environmental is the difference between high tide and low tide. Next, we have the Nearctic Zone. The Nearctic Zone is a relatively shallow part of the ocean between the low tide mark and the continental shelf. The Nearctic Zone is re receives plenty of sunlight, which means sunlight indicates photosynthesis. So we have photosynthetic organisms are able to live here with a relatively stable temperature, making it suitable for aquatic plant life. We love plants. Remember we said that if we have more plants in an area, we are generally going to have more animals, more diverse uh, food webs and ecosystems. This sunlight and stable temperature is great for supporting diverse ecosystems. The consistent temperature and low pressure, because we're not too deep, allow for marine life as small as plankton. Plankton are usually photosynthetic. They make their own food. Uh, all the way to large fish to survive. So this is, again, a really biodiverse area. We can have teeny tiny plankton that you can't even see until you get a microscope, or we can have large fish that you might fish for in a boat and win a prize for. So lots of life here. Again, this is the zone in between the intertidal zone and the zone that we are going to call the oceanic zone, but that is later. Here's an example of the uh, Nearctic zone. So the intertidal zone, again, is right here where the tide goes up and comes down. It's dry sometimes and wet other times. The Nearctic zone is the zone in between that and what we call the oceanic zone. Again, this is the continental shelf. So here we're sloping off right, right here. We haven't reached the continental slope just yet. We are on the downward slope. We haven't dropped down deep into the abyss just yet. But that is where we're headed, to the oceanic zone. The oceanic zone is the region of open sea beyond the edges of the continental shelf where the water measures 200 meters deep or deeper. This is really deep. Uh, this is like um, either submarine deep or even further than a submarine can go. 
The oceanic zone has a wide array of undersea terrain, like we talked about, crevices that are often deeper than Mount Everest is tall, as well as deep sea volcanoes and ocean basins. When we talked about our trenches in our abyssinal plain, we were talking about things that structures that are found in the oceanic zone. This is part of the ocean crust. This is no longer part of the continental shelf. We are definitely deep down into the sea. While it is often difficult for life to sustain itself in this type of environment, some species do thrive in the oceanic zone. We actually have lots of species that survive in this zone. Oceanographers divide the oceanic zone into zones according to how far down sunlight penetrates. So while we have this huge oceanic zone from here down, we divide it into three separate parts. You can see them right here, the photic, the aphotic, and the abyssal. Photic zone is where we have sunlight. It's also called the epi epigallic. See, we don't use those words that often. Photic zone, pretty much it's from zero to 200 meters down. We have the o aphotic zone. We call that twilight and midnight. We have two zones inside there. From 200 meters to 4,000 meters down, we'll practice these words. Mesopla mesoplagic and bathoplagic. And then we have the abyssal zone, which is greater than 4,000 meters down. We have what we call the abyssoplagic, the abyss, and we have the haldoplagic, which we call the trenches. So if you look right here, that's what we've got. We've got the end of the continental shelf right here, continental slope, and the continental rise, where the continental shelf starts to drop down onto that slope is where we have the breakaway from the from between the oceanic zone and the nordic zone so the oceanic zone is here and down the nordic zone is here and then we have the tidal zone right up here here you can see the break apart of those two we've got the sunlight zone right here the epo again should have practiced these epipalgic, pelagic, the sunlit zone from zero to 200 meters. We got the mesopelagic zone, the twilight zone. It's kind of light there. There's not a lot of, not a lot of light, not a lot of sunlight, meaning not a lot of plant life. And we got the bath, bathypelagic zone between about a thousand meters to 4,000 meters. And then once we hit 4,000 meters, we meet the abyssal zone which goes all the way down and then if we happen to have a trench we call that hadlopelagic. I will not ask you to memorize these words as you can see I did not memorize those words but the three bolded words on your notes you are expected to know, define, and understand the type of life and the sunlight that is found there. Okay I hope you enjoyed the video lecture we will talk more about ocean organisms in our next lecture. Have a great day, guys.